Sunday afternoon at 2 o'clock, you can see Elliot Medor, international rising star born in Toronto, was among the winners of the 2010 Met Opera Council auditions. And we finally have him here in Winnipeg for the very first time. Welcome to Manitoba. Hi, Elliot. thank you for having me. Such a pleasure. So uh, first, let's let's talk about this because you've been singing all over the world. And, you know, as all of us are curious, we want to know how, how singing happened for you. How did you end up at Curtis? Yeah, um, you know, when I was younger, uh, I always had an affinity for classical music. Um, it was something that I always loved to do, to listen to and to perform. And, uh, you know, I was in, uh, I was in uh, numerous choirs and, and uh, my teacher, um, my high school teacher, um, had told me that I should audition for Curtis, and he said that I had a uh, you know a, an operatic voice, and and he you know thought that it could be um, something worthwhile for me. And now, were you at any kind of performing arts high school or anything? Yeah, or yeah, a, I was. Okay. I was at um, a typical school of the arts okay. um, in Toronto, and uh, and uh, you know, of course, at that time, I didn't know that Curtis was um, a big deal. You know, I just right. I just didn't know, <laughs> um, and. Um, you know, uh, I auditioned, you know, the, my family and I drove down in the van Sweet. together and, uh, and I auditioned and, um, um, you know, I was lucky enough to get in and then it sort of, you know, everything sort of snowballed from there. Well, it, because you were so young, I mean, that 22 is really young to win the Met Council auditions. Yeah. Like that's, that was kind of a nom- an anomaly. Yeah. That's but fantastic. I mean, your voice, I'm sure, has yet settled further into itself yeah. since, you know. Um, well, w- let's talk about some of the stuff that you've been singing because, sure. I mean, it's this last season alone. I mean, you went from Rameau to Sondheim and like everything in between Mozart, yeah. Donizetti, Rossini, <laughs> Gounod, Ravel. Like you did the Ravel one acts, those are amazing. And the yeah. Strauss, too, like Ariadne. Like, yeah. I mean, these are all, they're very diverse roles. Like, how, how do you. How do you keep yourself in all of these different roles? Yeah, you know, I think I've been fortunate in that um, I've been offered, uh, you know, a wide variety of, um, you know, projects and, and you know, to perform the, to perform different uh, pieces from different composers and, um, you know, different styles of music. And, and uh, um, I've been fortunate in that respect. And, and I think it's also helped me to be uh, flexible and, and uh, you know, certainly to retain that flexibility in my voice. And, and uh, um, uh, yeah, and it's, you know, it's, it's helped me uh, even even personally, you know, I'd say I think I think, um, you know, performing, you know, a wide variety of music allows you to be more open, more vulnerable on stage. And, and uh, yeah, it's been a great journey. Excellent. Well, speaking of all of these different places that you can live vocally, like yeah. in your in your own instrument, like is there a place that you feel most at home? Is there a composer with whom you feel, or language that you feel most at home with? Or, um, you know, I, I certainly I love to perform French music, and and you know, Peleas is something um, right. that I've uh, performed a lot, and that I will be performing a lot in the future. Um, and uh, you know that. That feels uh, very, uh, very right for me. Uh, what is it about that role that gives you? The, is it something that you resonate with the character? Is it just just made for your instrument? Or um, I think it's twofold. I think um, I think Debussy writes those characters, both Golo and uh, Peleas, in a very um, vulnerable way. I think I think they're they're. Um, you can really explore the humanity in in both roles, and I think that's something that I, as a performer, really love to do. Um, and even within the music and within the text and within all of that, you, um, while, while you're on stage, you you can really uh, allow yourself to be vulnerable. And there's no surface um, level to any of these characters. You have to be uh, as introspective as you can be. Um, mm. It's a very Debussyan thing. It's a very, also a very French yeah, thing, you know, yeah, which no, is great, though. Absolutely. And and like it was also that time in music history where you know that that kind of trend started absolutely. going there. Absolutely, yeah. you know. Let's uh, let's talk a little bit about. Um, some, well, I was I was going to talk about some of the conductors that you've managed to work sure, with, and just sure. some of these some of these incredible names like Seiji Ozawa and yeah. James Levine. Yeah. Like, how have those people who have such such wisdom 
such perspective. How have they changed you? Like, I can, I can only yeah. imagine. Um, um, in ways that I, they've changed me in ways that I, that I probably uh, don't even know myself. Yeah, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. I mean, it's, you yeah. know, working with, um, well, they're really, they're geniuses, you know, uh, you know, and I remember, I was lucky enough, I, I, I sang um, the role of Don Giovanni with James Levine um, when I was 21. And I mean, that's, it was wow. really, it was a crazy thing to do. Um, wow. And, you know, he talked to me because, you know, I auditioned um, for him um, to get into Tanglewood. And, and he talked to me afterwards and he said that he wanted to have a young Giovanni so that the audience would feel um, sympathy for this young man who's going to die, you know, and it, I thought that was really interesting to to know that Levine wanted um, wanted Giovanni to be again this vulnerable um, and, uh, person and to have this sort of human side rather than being this sort of mm -hmm. demonic figure yeah having but, his own insecurities and yeah, kind of trying absolutely. to like well and there's there's a lot of that in there that could be construed uh you know the mozart is so flexible that way absolutely. i think well and having a director like james Levine, yeah. i mean being able to to make these conceptual decisions yeah. that can be so successful yeah. like yeah. and speaking of that as well may i ask about sure. period productions versus you know kind of these sure. new conceptual things i mean sure. where do you sound that we are in the studio sorry i should update our listeners we're in the studio right now with elliot Medor, uh baritone here uh for the women's musical club of winnipeg 1617 season he'll be singing on sunday afternoon at two o'clock at the muriel which is the muriel richardson auditorium at the winnipeg art gallery uh and we're just talking opera because this is what this brilliant child does right now um but he's going to be singing a recital but we'll get to that in just a bit um, I want to ask because this is such a you know a hot topic, and since you're on the scene right now, I mean you just did like the Met Live production of what were you just singing? Uh, Mercutio. Mercutio and uh, Bruno. Yeah. Great, yeah. which is amazing. You yeah. looked fantastic. <laughs> um, but I mean that was a period production, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And then you know we're talking about James Levine reconceptualizing uh, Mozart, Don Giovanni. Mm -hmm. So w w I mean, where do you stand on that? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a question on a lot of singers' minds and a lot of audiences' minds, you know. Mm. And, uh, I mean, certainly there's a big divide into whether, um, you know, singers like it or not. Um, uh, I think, um, personally speaking, I think modernizing um, opera and, and making, you know, taking these period pieces and, and putting them in a modern setting, I don't think that that's a bad thing. Mm. I think if it's done well, I think, uh, I think there can be a really... Uh, there can be a direct connection uh, with the audience. You know, I mean, personally speaking, um, you know, one of the first um, DVDs of an opera that I saw was uh, the Don Giovanni by Peter Sellers, right? Ugh. Which was set in uh, Manhattan. So good. Um, and yeah, it was it yeah. was uh, it was absolutely incredible. Mm -hmm. um, and it made sense, and you know, and it was uh, it was alive, and it was. Uh, um, it was just everything that I wanted opera to be. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think, um, I think there's certainly a place for modernizing opera in that sense. And I, and I think that, um, uh, I think that that's, it's a very important thing to do. And if it's done right, it can be a wonderful thing. Um, that being said, um, you know, of course, after, you know, working in Germany and, 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 uh, working in, in Switzerland as well, mm -hmm. you know, I've done a couple, um, Regie Theater's, uh, productions, you know, modern productions, mm -hmm. uh, with directors who impose their own version of what they think an opera should be. Mm -hmm. And, um, th that has no connection with the words or intention or anything like that. Um, and, you know, of course I don't agree with that. Uh, yeah. I think there needs to be some uh, connection there um, uh, for there to be, um, you know, uh, for an any, audience any to value. connect to the text exactly. and to, to the sentiment. And to, yeah, exactly. no, totally. Yeah. Well, let's talk about, I mean, you do concert work too, but mm -hmm. we you are also a recitalist. Mm -hmm. Not only have you sung at Carnegie, but mm -hmm. you've also sung at the National Arts Center, yes. uh, which is like our version, I guess, as close as we get. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, but um, tell us about what is valuable to you about art song, because I mean, and a lot of audience, just, you know, our general audience don't really realize there's a difference between opera and art song. And mm -hmm. so, so please let us know what that, that really carries for you. Sure. Um, 
I love uh, doing recitals. I think it's, I think it's the one chance that I get um, to really put my personal stamp on mm -hmm. on something, you know, because I'm for for once, you know, I'm I'm in charge and I don't have a, a director um, telling me where to stand and and what the intention should be and um, and so really I can I can pick my own songs uh, art songs from various composers and and put that in a program. Um, and and have it be something that uh, is very personal and and I think the other aspect of it is you know it's a it's an intimate setting you know the uh, the audience is close to you um, you know it's just you and the the pianist uh, and um, and I think having that intimacy and and having it be so personal um, I think that doing recitals can oftentimes be more gratifying than uh, doing an opera. I am going to agree with you as a singer, yeah. but no, I'm absolutely. like, it's, um, I, do you find that it also allows you to take different risk, like not just with, with how you interpret, mm -hmm. but also with the colors that you access in your instrument? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I, uh, you know, I think, um, you know, I was I was watching a, a, an interview recently with uh, Thomas Kwastoff, yeah. who's oh. a wonderful, wonderful leader singer. Incredible um, pedagogue as well. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and he was saying that, um, that you know, doing an opera and, and doing a recital are, you know, two completely different things. Mm -hmm. You know, in an opera, you have to um, think about projecting your voice over a 60-piece orchestra and, you know, projecting your voice out into a, you know, 3,000 seat house and uh so your your mind is going to be split you know you have to think a little bit about the technical aspects of projecting you know that kind of sound and of course you're thinking about intention and and you know what you're doing and and, and whatnot so basically what i'm trying to say is you you can't be uh um uh completely free on the operatic stage um you try your best but mm -hmm. uh, realistically that's that's uh, just not going to happen. But on the recital stage, your primary focus is intention, 100%. Uh, and the technical aspects of your singing can be really in the background, I think. Uh, and I think if you're not focused 100% on colors and intention, uh, then you're not you know, giving the recital its, its, uh, its due. So, Elliot, Elliot Medor here, baritone, singing with the Women's Musical Club of Winnipeg 16-17 season, uh, featuring Daryl Friesen at the mm -hmm. piano. That'll be amazing. Uh, this is the Winnipeg Art Gallery, Sunday afternoon at 2. Um, let's talk about the intention in your program sure. that you've brought. So, you have some leader guys, mm -hmm. Schumann leader mainstay then you've got the they find out popular mm -hmm. songs which are also incredible light fluffy yeah. dancey and then you've got the ives mm -hmm. which i i know none of those songs but mm -hmm. i i saw ich gola nicht, <laughs> yeah, right in the I middle so yeah. let's let's talk about the program because it <laughs> yeah, just it looks sure. really unique sure yeah um you know in all honesty um all of the pieces um I kind of, I, I love them each separately, and there's really no um, through composed idea for the entire recital. Um, each um, selection that I made uh, is really based on a, uh, a separate personal preference of mine. Uh, you know, the Liederkreis, um, what really drew me to that uh, initially was, of course, you know, I was listening to the first song, In der Fremde, and it's, uh, um, the narrator speaks of, um, leaving his homeland and 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 being a vagabond and and his mother and father have long since passed and and he um he's saying um wie bald ach, wie bald um kommt die stille zeit uh which means um how soon how soon will the 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 silent time come speaking of death <laughs> right. which is you know um as as an opera singer um, and as somebody who travels a lot, uh, it was something that really resonated with me because you know I certainly miss my homeland and you know, that being Canada. Right, it's good to be yeah. back, by the way. Yes, thank um, you. Welcome, <laughs> welcome back. But um, you know that's something that really resonated with me. Um, you know, being a, a foreigner everywhere I go, and and uh, so that was. So again, it's just that personal connection um, that I had with that piece, and of course, in listening to the rest of it, um, you know, the the poet Eichendorf, 
um, you know, talks about reconciliation with nature and, and you see that that's a through composed theme. Um, uh, but really, uh, also, if I may, sorry, I, I don't mean to be Please. <laughs> talking so much no. about it, but it's, uh, it's good. you know, it's just something I'm uh, passionate about. Um, uh, but one of the things that I love about the Lidokais is that um, so many of the endings of songs are always uh, open-ended. Uh, and they're always, um, there's always a big question mark um, at the end of these songs. Um, uh and uh you know that's something um that 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 really resonated with me it's it's something that resonated with me in in you know peleas mm-hmm. you know there's always um um it's sort of difficult to explain but um we don't necessarily know uh how the character feels uh in these songs and even though he's saying one thing the pianist is sort of insinuating uh, another thing. And it's, uh, so there's lots of question marks in that. And, and it's something that I love to play with and find different colors and different intentions. And, uh, the ambiguity of it is, is really a beautiful thing. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> um, and of course the Defia, yes, uh, the Defia is, uh, um, uh, a little lighter, you know, it's, a they're Spanish folk songs. Um, and each song deals with love in a different way. And uh, typically these are songs that are sung by women. Um, but, um, you know, I'd found that there's really, in the text, there isn't really um, uh, any obvious moment where it should be sung by a woman. Um, <clears throat> um, uh, so, you know, I thought, why not? And, and uh, you know, it's something that really fits my temperament. And it's it's a really visceral song cycle and... and uh, uh, something that I enjoy doing. And, uh, of course, uh, the Ives, um, and there's a couple of fun tunes in there. Um, the circus band and, and the sideshow, um, they're just, you know, fun little ditties, uh, maybe to, to lighten up <laughs> the yeah. program a little bit. It's <laughs> a little heavy. Second half, second half will be <laughs> yeah. light and lovely. Yeah. It'll yeah. be right. Yeah. Fine. Um, and, uh, um, you know, Tom Sails Away, um, I mean, that's a beautiful atmospheric song. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, Ich Krolle Nicht, um, it's a, it, that's a great piece. Um, uh, of course, you know, that was a song, uh, uh, the text uh, was uh, uh, written beautifully, uh, composed to music beautifully by Sch- uh, Schumann mm-hmm. in the Dichte Liebe. And um, Ives takes it in this uh, completely different way, and I just I just find it so fascinating to, you know, to hear a different composer's view on, you know, how he thinks it should be, um, you know, composed. And Especially someone so removed from Schumann, yeah. and seemingly, and, yeah. but I mean, still so connected in other ways. Yeah, right? no, absolutely, yeah. and you yeah. know, it's just it's a really fun, um, um, fun thing to sing. So. In any case, I'm I'm really looking forward to it and uh, happy to be in Winnipeg. Well, and I'm sure our audiences will be very happy to hear it. Elliot Medor, baritone, performing on Sunday afternoon at 2 p.m. as part of the Women's Musical Club of Winnipeg 1617 season. I think it's, in fact, their final installment of this season. Uh, so glad to have you here in Winnipeg. Please check it out for more info, Women's Musical Club of WPG.ca, or, of course, you can go to our website, classic107.com. Sir, it has been a pleasure to have you. Thank you for having me. Thank Thanks. Come back anytime. Oh, please. Yeah, of course. <laughs>